Okay, welcome to this tutorial tonight. Uh, um, we're going to be talking about air conduction testing. Um, basically, the last couple of weeks we've looked at the audiogram um, and why we use that to record our results and then we've looked at um, what actually happens in the clinic appointment. Now there's lots of different tests that we can use and air conduction testing is part of pure tone audiometry. So we're looking at how that um, relates in the pure tone audiometry battery of tests. All right, so what does air conduction testing actually mean or do? Well, we're going to, we are using air conducted pure tones. Um, we are looking to determine how much hearing loss is present. So that's what air conduction testing will tell us, how much hearing loss is present. So tonight we're going to cover um, testing the peripheral pathway, so that's the peripheral pathway of, of sound through the ear. We're going to look at what pure tone audiometry is, have a quick look at what equipment we use, um, what frequencies uh, we test when we're doing air conduction testing. We're going to talk about the Houston Westlake procedure, which is something that um, is universally known about and used, um, and we're going to have a quick look at recording results. So are we OK to get started, Colin? Any questions on what we're going to cover tonight? Great. OK, off we go. So here we've got a nice picture of the ear. And um, with air conduction testing, we are testing the whole peripheral pathway. Now, um, our ear, basically, we have our, our the outside of the ear. What we see is our pinna. And we have our ear canal, um, and sound gets gathered up by the pinna, um, moves down the ear canal, hits the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, which um, um, vibrates and sets up a rocking motion um, of the three ossicles that are attached from the tympanic membrane into the oval window. Um, so we've got the malleus, incus, and stapes. They're our um, impedance matching system in there, in the middle ear system. And the stapes sits on the oval window and as it moves it pushes the um, oval window in and out which displaces the fluid that's in the cochlea. And in the cochlea is where all the nerves of hearing are. And, and they're called our cilia. And the cilia are attached to spiral ganglion which is all gathered together in the eighth nerve which then takes the signal up to the brain. That is our entire peripheral pathway. So when we put an air conducted sound in, it will take it from the pinna and it will measure how it, when we're doing air conduction testing, we'll measure how that sound travels from the pinna all the way up to the, um, up to the eighth nerve and into the brain. So it's giving us an overall view of, of um, how we hear and it will tell us how bad the hearing is. So how loud do we have to turn the sound up before the client is able to hear the noise? What it doesn't tell us is where the site of lesion is. Um, so it doesn't tell us anywhere that the hearing problem might be in the ear. Sometimes from the shape of the air conduction results we will get um, uh, some sort of indication but um, uh, but that's not definitive and we need to put air conduction with bone conduction results to actually tell us where the site of lesion is in the ear. Um, but that's, um, Monica's going to talk to, about bone conduction next week. So just for air conduction, all we will know at the end of it is how bad the hearing loss is in each frequency. Okay. And as I said, the sound is transmitted via air when testing with air conduction. That's why it's called air conduction. So with bone conduction, it's transmitted via the bone. But that will be explained next week. So um, air conduction is part of pure tone audiometry. So we are testing a person's hearing using pure tones. And pure tone audiometry is used to determine the threshold of hearing of the client and it's defined as the lowest hearing level at which the client responds to at least 50% of the time to an auditory stimuli. Um, and generally we obtain thresholds for each ear individually um, or separately. Every now and again you might do a binaural test. Importantly to remember it is a subjective test. 
which means we are relying on the, um, the client's ability to understand our instructions and to respond in an appropriate manner. Um, if they are unwell, or n not concentrating or trying to fake a hearing loss or don't understand our um, instructions, we, we may not get a reliable test and that, that's what happens with a subjective test. Um, but on the, on the most part, if you inst if you know what you're doing, if you instruct the client correctly, um, you put the headphones on properly, and they are motivated and and well, um, you will get a pretty good indication of what their threshold of hearing is. So remember, it's threshold we're looking for. We're looking for the softer sounds they can hear. And last week, Pia talked about um, instructing the client for the um, to raise their hand or press the button whenever they hear a beep, no matter how soft, um, because we want to know their threshold of hearing. Now, what sort of um, equipment will we use? Well, firstly, um, it's really good to have a soundproof bo proof booth. Not everyone has one, but if you can have one, that's great. If you have got one, you've got to make sure standards. And just because you've got one, it doesn't mean it's it's fantastic forever. You will need to have the seals um, checked and replaced on occasion, and it's generally about every five years. Um, booths are varying sizes. This one's quite a small one. It's just a one-man booth with a viewing window. Um, and some I, I once worked in one which was oh, a magnificent beast. It was. Um, Gosh, we, you could have comfortably sat um, six people at tables inside the booth, um, and it was um, it was a, a, tr a test, a training booth. So you had a big window on the outside where people could watch what was going on inside. And in that case, you, the tester could either sit in with the client and do the test, or they could sit outside the booth and observe um, or be twiddling with the dials on the outside. So there are many, many sizes. Sometimes you can get an acoustically treated room, which will bring the sounds down. But a booth is best for um, most accurate and reliable results. As I said, they're varying sizes. And it's best if they're elevated off the floor. Um, and this is to stop um, low frequency building noise interfering with the test. Um, that's quite um, a, a common problem with the vibration of just building movement um, is, is generally around is low frequency and it can affect um, the, the client hearing um, low frequency noise. And it's important to remember that some clients are claustrophobic and if, um, if you've got a small booth such as this one, um, closing the door will, will make them very uncomfortable and you won't get a good test at all. And so it's okay to um, to have the door open. If it means the difference between getting a test um, and not getting a test, put the door, uh, open the door. And you can generally, uh, not, not all of them will tell you, but you can see by the frightened look on their face as you go to close the door that it might be a little bit um, scary for them to be locked in what looks like a refrigerator. Colin, have you um, ever experienced anyone with claustrophobia while testing? No, um, I've, I've seen it a few times um, and um, doesn't affect the, the results too much just by opening the door. So always be aware that that can happen. Okay, the most important piece of equipment, of course, is our audiometer. Um, now, we, we, had a, we looked at a video last week on, on how um, to do a daily listening check on the audiometer. And it's really important to um, make sure that everything is working properly before you start. Now, an audiometer is a machine that has tones of varying frequencies and amplitude. Um, we can have screening or diagnostic audiometers. It depends on the requirements. Uh, you'll know if it's a diagnostic audiometer if it has one or two channels. Two channel audiometers are diagnostic ones. Uh, and if you're going to be doing speech testing, you need a, um, you need a diagnostic or two channel audiometer. Um, they can be a standalone piece of equipment such as this one, or it can be um, inbuilt into the as part of the computer software. So even, even um, you know when we go through the daily listening check, you still need to do that if you've got a um, your audiometer's uh, a software in your computer. And you still have to make sure it's turned on and that the um, all the everything's connected properly and that there's no cross heard, heard signal going between the the earphones of the of the pieces of of the transducers, the headphone and the bone conductors working properly and so on. 
So um, it doesn't matter what type you've got, you still have to check it and make sure it's all working properly. Uh, to send a sound via air conduction, we need a transducer. Now that could be a headphone or insert earphones. And then the other way to transmit sound is via bone, and for that we need a bone conductor. And when we, uh, when you get a chance to have a look at an audiometer, you can see there's all sorts of um, different on 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 most not on small screening ones, but on most other ones, you can have different types of um, things that you need to set. Now, um, you, you will have a um, a dial for your decibel, so you can turn it up or down. You'll have a setting for your frequencies, so you need to um, change the frequencies as you're testing. You uh, will also be able to select um, generally either pure tone or warble tones for your testing. And for air conduction testing, we generally do use pure tones. Sometimes um, for when testing children, we'll use a warble tone. That's because it's a more interesting sound for a child. The other thing you might wish to select is whether you're going to use a pulsed or a steady tone. Generally, you use a steady tone, but if you have a person who's got um, uh, significant tinnitus and they're having trouble hearing the sounds, especially the high frequency ones, because their tinnitus might be around that pitch, you would then choose a pulse pulse tone and say to them, instead of hearing a beep, you'll be listening for a beep, 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 beep. And that is um, sometimes easier for them to detect over the, the um, the tinnitus noise that's, that they can hear. And the other piece of equipment are the headphones, which again we, we've talked about, um, we talked about last week and we watched a little video on placing the headphones. Um, and the important thing to remember, a couple of important things to remember about the headphone is that it's calibrated to a single audiometer, so you cannot switch your, your headphones between machines. If you do, you have an unreliable test. Um, as a tester, you placed the headphones, the client does not, and the red one goes on the right ear, the blue one on the left ear. You've got to make sure that you're placing the earphone directly over the opening to the ear canal. And once you've placed them and the client's comfortable, you know, the client's not to touch them because we don't want them moving them around because that could affect the seal of the um, cushions. Okay, fairly straightforward. Now the other thing that you can use um, to test via air conduction is insert earphones. Colin, have you ever used insert earphones? No, you don't think so. Okay, I I haven't used them very much. I've used them on occasion, but they are really good because they um, uh, they lessen the need for masking because the interaural attenuation value is greater um, because the sound's going more directly into the um, close into the ear canal so the sound's not leaking out and crossing over. With headphones, um, once there's a difference between the ears of 40 decibels, you could have um, cross-heard signal. With insert earphones, it's as much as 60 decibels, so that, that, um, that's a good thing about it. You wouldn't use them for on a client who has um, you know, uh, either in, impacted wax or in, um, sort of some sort of outer ear condition or infection. Um, because they're a little foam plug that you roll down and um, pop in the person's ear. And there are two sizes for these little plugs and you need to sterilise them or, or throw them away after each use. As I said, it reduces the amount of cross-heard sig signal or interaural attenuation. You've got to make sure you have the right size. Um, men obviously generally go for the bigger size, women and children the smaller size. Um, we open the, up the ear canal to put them in. We pull the pinner up and back, back, sorry, up and out, and we roll the inserts flat and place gently in the ear canal. And then you clip these little things here onto their shirt or collar somewhere, and that just holds them in place. And you can see we've got a red one and a blue one. So red for the right ear, blue for the left. Same as with headphones. All right. So we've popped our headphones on or our insert earphones in and we want to um, know what frequencies we're going to test. And we've talked about the audiogram before, so we know we've got um, eight, eight um, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six octaves and then we've got some inter-octaves that we might need to test. Now, um, we, we generally test in this order, 1,000 hertz, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 
them back to 500 and 250, they can be in either order. And you should always go back and retest 1000 hertz. Now, why do you think we start at 1000 hertz when testing Colin? Why do we not start at 250 hertz, go from low frequency to high frequency, or start at 8000 hertz and go from 8000 downwards? It's not just because 1000 is in the middle of the graph. It's there actually is a reason for it, and that's because 1000 hertz is uh, one of the easier frequencies to hear, um, and and mo generally, unless they've got a significant hearing loss, most people can hear 1000 at around normal normal or near normal levels. So and then we go up in the frequencies and then we go down and do the lower frequencies. With, when you're testing people, um, if you're testing at 1000 hertz and let's say they hear at 10 decibels and then at 2000 hertz they don't hear until 40 decibels, that's a drop of 30 decibels between one frequency to the next. And what we say is that if there's a, a drop of 10 de uh, sorry of 20 decibels or more between frequencies um, in volume, so we we actually like the interactive frequency to be tested as well, just to see what's going on there. So if you test it, you you generally test the octaves first, so 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 500, 250, then go back and see what sort of difference there is between each of the octaves, and if there's a a, a, a change in decibel level of 20 decibels or more, go and test the interactive frequency. Now, the testing procedure we use is something that's called the Houston Westlake technique. It's been around for a long time and it was developed by Houston and Westlake in 1944 as an ascending technique. So they started at zero and worked up. Um, we actually use what's called the modified Houston and Westlake technique, and this this modified version was developed by Carhart and Jerger in 1959 and is now accepted as the universal testing procedure for pure tone audiometry. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the up 5 dB, down 10 dB method or the ascending and descending method. So I'm going to explain that in a little bit more detail now. But you will generally find that audiologists and audiometrists worldwide use this procedure. So first of all, we like to familiarise the client a bit with the with the process, and it helps confirm the client has understood your instructions and what's required of them. So we start at a, um, if you know after chatting to them, you think oh they might have a bit of a hearing loss, but they're not too bad. So you want to give them a, an easy sound to hear first, and we start at 1,000 hertz between 40 to 60 decibels, um, and most clients will hear somewhere in that range comfortably. But if they don't hear, we're going to have to turn it up a bit louder. But you use your judgment for the starting point. Okay, after you've done, you've interviewed your client, um, you can you know if you've had to raise your voice um, a fair bit during the interview, you might think, well, I'm going to need to start a bit louder than you know 60 decibels. Okay, so let's say say we've put a sound in at 60 decibels, and the client hears that response. Great. So what we're going to do is we're going to reduce our decibel level by 10 each time we go down. So we're going to drop it. Uh, from 60 decibels to 50 decibels, and, and then they still hear, so we go down another 10 decibels to 40 decibels, and they still hear, so we go down another 10 decibels to 30 decibels. And you, so you keep going down until they don't hear anymore. Once you've got to found the spot that where they don't hear, so let's say our client stopped hearing at 30 decibels, I've now got to go up in five. So they didn't hear at 30, so I'm going to 35, and I'm waiting to see if they hear. If they do hear at 35, fantastic, but I'm going to go back another 10 to 25 decibels and come up again in 5 dB steps until I get another response. And if I get that response again at 35, that's great. I've, I've come up twice to 35. So this is, this is our pattern. We go down in 10 dB steps and we go up in 5 dB steps. We get a bit of a pattern going. It's you know, trying to come up to the sound to see where they're where we're getting their threshold, and that's the important thing to remember. Hitting threshold, so we continue on that f five dB up and ten dB down method, and now we we know we've reached threshold when we get two out of three responses obtained at the same decibel level in an ascending manner. 
So once you've come up twice to the same level, you can accept that as threshold. So threshold is determined when two out of three responses are obtained, obtained at the same level in an ascending manner. Really important to remember. So say if, if, they, if they heard at 40 and you dropped to 30 and they didn't hear and, and then you come up to 35 and they hear, so don't hear at 30, so you go up to 35 and they do hear, drop it by 10 and then you come up in five decibels and they hear at 30, that's, even though you've come up twice, that's not your threshold because they've only heard once at 30. So then you have to go down another 10 and then come up again to 30. And if they hear it that second time, then that is threshold. So your threshold is, is determined when two out of three responses obtained at the same decibel level in an ascending manner or coming up to it. Does that make So let's, let's pretend we're doing a test. We're starting, we, we start with the right ear or the better ear. Now in your interview you would have said the client are both uh, both your ears the same or is one worse than the other? If they've said they're both the same, protocol is you generally start with the right ear. If they say that um, um, you, the left ear is your, their better ear, start with the left ear. Because we want to make the first sound they hear a fairly easy one. So if they say, oh, I can't hear any other right ear, what's the point of starting with that one? So always start with the better ear if it's acknowledged. We start, at, as I said before, at 1000 hertz at around 60 decibels and we present our tone. The optimal time of tone, tone presentation is 1.5 to 2 seconds in length. Um, now studies have been done on that, it's not just a, you know, something we've pulled out of the air. This is, um, it's shown that anything less than 1.5 seconds, if you hold down a tone, it, it isn't long enough for um, the, the, the brain to actually acknowledge that the sound's been heard generally, um, especially if there is a little bit of a hearing loss. And any, anything greater than two seconds, you can just keep holding it down and keep holding it down. If they can't hear it, they can't hear it. They, they will have heard it by two seconds. No point holding on any longer if you're not getting a response. Importantly, most importantly, present in a random manner. Don't be rhythmical, which is sometimes a bit hard to, to do. You sort of want to get through your test and you end up getting presenting in a rhythmical manner. Try not to be like that. Um, try and vary your uh, the, the gaps of time in between each tone that you present. Being rhythmical will give the client cues as to when the next sound is going to come. And if they're someone who's trying to fake a hearing loss, they, they'll just count in between each one, know when the tones are going to be there. Um, so really watch yourself with um, being random. And also not cueing the client. Um, if, especially if you're, if you're testing children, they'll often want to do the right thing. So if your hands are obvious or you blink every time you present a tone, they'll pick up on that and they'll just watch for those cues. So lots of things to be aware of as you're testing. So if we've, we've given a tone at 60 decibels and if the client responds, reduce by 10 de decibels and present again. And as I said before, we'll just keep descending until the client stops responding. Then we will ascend or increase the tone by 5 decibels and present until the client responds again. Go down again in 10 decibels, come up in 5 dB again until the client responds for a second time. Threshold is determined when client responds to two out of three tones at the same level, as we've said. Okay, so now we've, we've talked a bit now about the test and how it works. Um, so they're all important things to remember. So once we're starting to get results, we need to record them on the audiogram. So here we've got um, quite uh, clearly our audiogram, remembering that low frequency uh, um, goes through, sorry, low frequency um, starts on the left hand side and we go across to high frequencies and at the top of the graph is the softest sounds going to the loudest one, so from 0 decibels all up to 120 decibels. And on this graph we've got the circles indicate our right ear and the crosses indicate our left ear. And we have red circles and blue crosses. You don't have to have the red and, and the blue pen, but um, it's, it's good if you can. All right, so um, how, how do we actually plot? Well, let's have a little look here. All right, the first thing that's, that I'm going to do is um, we're going to look for the right here and we find 1000 hertz 
at 20 dB. So that's where we want our um, our tone. That's where we want our red circle to be because we are, are doing the right here. And there it is. And now 50 decibels at 2,000 hertz. So here's 2,000 hertz. Here's 50 decibels. So that's where we want our circle to be. And there it is. Okay, 4,000 hertz. We've got 4,000 and we're at 70 dB. So let's hope it goes there. Yep. And then we've got 80 dB at 8,000 hertz, which would be this spot here. And there it is. And for 250 hertz and 500 hertz, we're going to be at 10 dB. Let's have a look. Spot on. Okay, and then I, if, if I believe my results, I would join, oh no, I'd test the lefty and then if I believe them, I'd join them up with lines and crosses and dashed lines. But what can you, what can you tell me about this audiogram, Colin? There's something else that um, I, I should do. Well, what, what I should have done and I haven't done here is my interactive frequencies, I have to count between each uh, octave to see if I've got greater than 20 decibels difference. And 1000 hertz was at 20 dB and 2000 hertz was at 50. So I've got a, um, a 30 decibel drop there. So I really need to test 1500 hertz. And then the same between 2000 and 4000, there's a 20 dB difference because we've got 50 and 70. So I really should have tested at 3000 hertz as well. I didn't, but if I was doing it properly, that's what I would have done. And there's our left ear results as well that have jumped in there. So the left ear we can see at 30 decibels at 1000 hertz and we've got 50 again at 2000 hertz. Um, at 4000 hertz we've got 60 decibels. 8000 we're exactly the same as the right ear so we've got 80. And then at uh, 250 we've got 10 the same as the right ear and the left ear at 500 hertz is at 15 decibels. So that's how that audiogram for air conduction only would look. But there's a lot more work to be done on that yet. And um, that's the sort of thing that Monica will go on next week, talking about bone conduction. OK, so in summary, our air conduction is a part of the pure tone audiometry battery. And the thresh it's a threshold test using pure tones at varying frequencies. And those frequencies are important to speech. They're in the speech range, and as we looked last week, we saw the speech banana. So we want to test the frequencies that will affect our communication ability. Um, we're going to use an audiometer. Um, we're going to hopefully have a uh, soundproof booth, and we're going to uh, use an air conduction transducer to transmit the sound. That will either be our headphones or our insert earphones. We use the modified Hughes and Westlake technique to achieve threshold, which is an ascending, descending technique and we'll test our octaves and our inter-octave frequencies if they're required. Um, and as we go, we plot our results on the audiogram using the um, right ear as a circle, red if you've got a red pen, and the left ear is across a blue one if you've got a blue pen. So any questions on that? Okay, all fairly straightforward. So next week, um, as I said, Monica is going to talk about bone conduction testing, so we'll learn all about this little implement here and what it's doing. Um, importantly, we'll look at things like how to place the bone conductor, which is very important to getting correct results, and how to record the bone conduction results on the audiogram. And next week, as I said, Monica is doing it, but we will be starting an hour later. It will be starting at 7 p.m.